creating new land. So what? Defeatism. Well, I'm here to tell you that is the biggest challenge we have. The bargain that paternalistic government is making with our children to stop thinking that mankind can't accomplish anything more. It's all over. Well, the heart of Atlas Shrugged's message is the human mind is capable of almost everything if we have a system predicated on the rule of law and one that celebrates achievement. And that's what we're here for. Fred Smith has brought a wonderful prop and has a wonderful speech. And he will go first, followed by Ed Crane, followed by Ed Hutchins. I don't know, wonderful speech. Uh, next week, I have to give a talk to the International Bottled Water Association. <laughs> but it was all right, because a month ago, I gave one to the Public Works Water Association. And they don't want us to drink the water out of our taps, chemicals. They don't want us to drink this, because plastics, I don't know, alcohol, maybe you guys. Are, um, like most of you, I've read Ed and Rand, but last, yesterday, when I realized I really had to give a speech, I thought I'd go back and reread it. Um, it wasn't that easy. I got to page 500 and realized it was 11 o'clock. I better write my speech, so that's what I did. Um, thanks, John. Thanks, all of you. It's really an honor to speak on the 50th anniversary of one of probably the most important books in the world. Like many of you, it all began with Rand. But for me, it was a little different. I read Rand, or Atlas Shrugged, in my sophomore year in college and knew at once that if I accepted this book, then I couldn't be a socialist. And as a Southerner in a still racist world, knowing little of politics, economics, or history, and experiencing the heady flavor of egalitarianism that you most feel at that period, I wanted to be at least a liberal. I wasn't a, I wasn't a racist. What else could I be? I had no idea. Uh, but the seeds were planted, and a decade later, when I went through my statist uh, experience, turning me and probably millions of others into free market types, uh, and with, uh, Rand's work was very important. So there's a debate about whether it's Ayn Rand or Ayn Rand. I, there's a debate on the panel about that. Um, but Atlas helped in the conversion because Rand understood very well that in business and in the intellectual, uh, why the business and politics creates the intellectual roots of statism. And that's my topic today. Rand understood very well the risk of an increasingly mixed economy, how politics could corrupt and threaten business, and why we have to resist that. Atlas itself uh, foreshadowed many of the business and political debates that characterize today. Rent-seeking, corporate social responsibility, sustainable development, the precautionary principle, efforts to drive market ideas from the marketplace of ideas. But Rand did not close the debate on this. She actually only began to open it. She did not really deal with, uh, she did deal with what the business should or shouldn't do in the morally and intellectually foggy world of the mixed economy of today. At first brush, if you read Atlas, it seems that she suggests, like T.J. Rogers does, ignore politics and it'll all go away. Well, but Atlas also suggests that's a little painful and that there are ideas she raises about how we might choose ways of better creating a strategy to get us out of this crazy place we've got ourselves into. The entrepreneurial class, the Hank Ridderns of the world, the pro-economic intellectuals, we in this room, have yet to create the offensive alliance we need to make this happen. Atlas on business and politics. Atlas Shrugged begins with the question, who is John Galt, and ends with Galt tracing in the air the sign of the dollar. But in between the 1,166 pages, including the speech, that I didn't get fully to read last night, we've experienced a dramatic review, an accelerated format of the Schumpeterian thesis question, can capitalism survive? And she ends up with a much more positive answer than Schumpeter did. Her novel can be seen as examining that Schumpeterian thesis as a heroic novel. Free individuals create wealth. That wealth makes possible the emergence of a middle class. The middle class means people who don't have to work from sunup to sundown. Some become entrepreneurs, doers. But that creates even a larger middle class in the next generation. Others become thinkers, intellectuals. What's it all about? Why is there racism, poverty, sexism, war, and so forth? These are interesting questions. We want gadflies always thinking about how society could become even better. How could we move towards our ideals? But the intellectuals, after all, occasionally look up from their scribblings and say, wait a minute. If we're so moral and good and smart, why the hell are they making all the money? They're envious. And envy, being an unadmirable uh, trait, is quickly rejected, reformed, transformed into theories of social delegitimization of the marketplace. 
Entrepreneurs, heroes, give me a 